Hello and welcome to Crypto TV. I'm your host, Ornella Hernandez. Today we'll talk about Binance's new legal woes, the latest crypto craze over Blast, and we have a special guest joining us, so stay tuned. Last week, cryptocurrency exchange Binance changed its leadership. We'll give an update on what Changpeng Zizi Zhao is dealing with. And for those who are fans of pro soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo, you won't like what I'll have to say about him. Oh, and if you keep hearing about a new project called Blast, I'll give you all the details on it. On November 21st, CZ reached a $4.3 billion settlement with the US government for allegedly allowing persons engaged in illicit activities to transfer funds through Binance. As part of the settlement, CZ resigned as chief executive officer of the cryptocurrency exchange with the largest trading volume in the world. Although the settlement allows him to retain his majority stake in Binance, he will not be allowed to hold an executive position at the cryptocurrency exchange while it continues to operate. Apparently, this was one of the largest penalties ever levied against a company in a criminal matter, according to the Department of Justice's press release, noting that the resolution includes monitorship and reporting requirements for the next five years. CZ's departure from Binance follows a string of high-level executives departing the exchange in its U.S. affiliate. Now, CZ pled guilty to violating U.S. anti-money laundering requirements as part of the deal in a Seattle court. But his sentencing is expected to take place in February 2024. And now, pending a judge's decision, he's stuck in the U.S. until then. Thing is, though, he normally lives in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai with his family. So CZ and his lawyers claim that he is not a flight risk and that he will return before his sentencing next year if he's allowed to travel. He could receive a sentence between 12 to 18 months in a minimum security prison, but I'm sure that his team will ask for an alternative sentence, combining prison with house arrest and probation. It's clear that the Justice Department wants to use CZ as an example to deter future money laundering behavior in the cryptocurrency world. But for the DOJ to succeed in getting more jail time for him, that may not be so easy, unless they have a lot more substantial evidence implicating him in criminal activity. Otherwise, it's gonna be hard for some people to accept Binance without CZ or CZ without Binance, but I guess that's just the way things are. And in CZ's wake, Binance will be led by Richard Tang, who was previously Binance's global head of regional markets. Now, in other Binance news, this one is about celebrity endorsements. This week, pro soccer star Cristiano Ronaldo was sued for promoting Binance through his Binance Tied NFTs. A November 27 filing to the United States District Court in Florida claimed Ronaldo promoted, assisted in, and or actively participated in the offer and sale of unregistered securities in coordination with Binance. The complaint was made by three men who seek damages and funds to cover legal fees. They claim that they suffered losses from his promotion of the now legally embroiled Binance and that those who signed up for Ronaldo's NFTs were more likely to use Binance for other purposes, such as investing in what they claim are unregistered securities, including Binance's BNB native token and its crypto yield programs. Binance entered a multi-year partnership with Ronaldo in mid-2022 to promote a series of his own non-fungible tokens with at least three of the soccer star's collections tied to Binance. I mean, it's only natural that Ronaldo was a key part of Binance's growing popularity due to his influence and reach. Isn't that the whole point of celebrity endorsements to get their followers and fans into what they're into? Well, that's exactly what happened here. His NFT sales were incredibly successful and resulted in a major increase in searches for and interest in Binance the week following the initial sale. 
But the suit alleges Ronaldo knew or should have known about Binance selling unregistered crypto securities as he has investment experience and vast resources to obtain outside advisors, according to the documents. The suit cited U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, guidance warning celebrities of the need to disclose payments received for promoting cryptocurrencies, which the complaint claims that Ronaldo didn't do. This is going to be a game changer for celebrity endorsements out there. I mean, do you guys remember what happened with FTX and all of those celebrities and public figures like Giselle, the model, and Tom Brady, the football player, who endorsed the defunct exchange? Well, they were sued as well. Most of them settled, yes, but still, it's not a good look for them and for the greater crypto industry if they're attaching their name to blockchain companies or projects and these companies keep getting sued or tangled up in legal messes. Seems like there is a new lawsuit every day, folks, unfortunately. But hey, that's the news for you. Now, another theme within the industry is that every day there seems to be a shiny new toy that crypto investors obsess over. Sort of like a crush. Well, the newest crush is on Blast. It's an Ethereum Layer 2 network, and L2s are like the tags that we affix in our cars that allow us to pass through toll roads more quickly. Well, Blast incorporates native yield for ETH and stablecoins. Users deposit money on Blast and get a percentage yield in return. ETH is automatically staked with Lido to earn 4%, and stablecoins are converted to DAI and staked with MakerDAO to earn 5%. This project was founded by Pac-Man. Yes, like the arcade game. The creator's government name is actually Tai Shung Rokere, but let's stick with Pac-Man. Oh, and he's also the founder of Blur, which is one of the top NFT marketplaces. Blast raised $20 million from Paradigm, Standard Crypto, Primitive Ventures, and a few other angel investors. Even though Blast launched with early access last week, in only five days, it reached $564 million in total value locked. This matters because it makes Blast one of the fastest growing chains ever, which is why many people are also pointing out that Blast has a lot of red flags. For example, it doesn't have a live product yet, the L2 network is officially launching next year, and users can't withdraw their funds until February 2024. Also, project funds are controlled by five unknown multi-signature wallets, but it also claims to have risk-free returns. Not a good sign, folks. It has this reward system where users get points when they deposit money and invite other people to join. And some are calling out this reward system for looking like a Ponzi scheme. A Ponzi scheme is like a form of fraud that lures in new investors and pays profits to earlier investors with the funds of the most recent investors. So in Blast's case, things are looking like a dating app profile that's just too good to be true, you know? Blast may look like a hot supermodel, but it has a very questionable bio. Too many red flags for my liking. No product and no way to withdraw funds. So I think I'm gonna swipe left for now. Another profile that we all swiped left on a while ago is Sam Bankman fried or SBF, former CEO of FTX. One day he was a billionaire who was being called the next Warren Buffett. And then the next, he was convicted of fraud. And if you are curious about how SBF is doing, we recently got a sneak peek into how prison life is going thanks to the Wall Street Journal. Apparently, he shares a cell with a former Honduran president and a former top cop of Mexico who allegedly helped the Sinaloa cartel smuggle tons of cocaine. He uses also mackerel fish as currency to pay for stuff like haircuts, services, etc. And he's also giving out crypto tips to the prison guards. He has a specialized laptop that only he can use in a room that has desks separated by plastic dividers, kind of like in an elementary school. Not sure what he uses that for. I mean, how things can change in a year. Who would have thought that we'd see SPF trading mackerel fish and people who still trust him with crypto tips? It's crazy. So to talk more about all this, we have a special guest joining us on Crypto TV today.
And today's special guest on Crypto TV is Clarence Liu, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Owl Protocol. How are you today? Great. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for joining me. Yep. First off, before we get into your background and what you do, just wanted to get pick your brain a little bit, get your opinion on Blast, which is a big hot topic right now, and ask you, do we need another Layer 2, another L2? What do you think? Yeah, honestly, we kind of do, right? We do see a lot. I, I've been in crypto for a very long time, seeing chains every week. We see a new chain almost, right? <laughs> um, and I'm more on the technical side. So yes, I typically, I come at it from the perspective of, do we, are there any technical uh, improvements that this team actually made, right? Mm. Is it faster? Is it more secure? Typically, you don't see that anymore. Now you have things like app yeah. chains and parachains. I mean, they claim that, but or, is it truly cheaper and faster? At the end of the day, the, the blockchain trilemma still stands, right? There's still no magic way to figure it out or just some you know, smoke and mirrors. Um, but I, you are seeing with Blast and Blur and these chains, there is some sometimes a case for, I guess you consider them like parallel like side chains or mm -hmm. app chains, right? And the Blast isn't really an L2, it's just, it's just a contract. Like, I don't want to go get into it, but I mean, on Twitter, if you just follow Clarence Liu, I just recently reposted a few days ago this whole analysis how it's just a three, three out of five multi-sig. And yes, they can steal all your funds if these guys wanted to. Right, right. right? They um, claim it's like risk-free, but like it never is, especially never is. if you yes. need so many signatures for that. But the thing is like Linea and all these other, like, you know, a lot of these L2s, you see even Scrolls, EK, EVM, they are actually also have built-in upgradability. Mm -hmm. So technically they can actually just upgrade and, you know, change it. I know things... Certain chains like Arbitrum One, for example, they have like a 12 day waiting period, like cool down period. So okay. if you try to initiate some sort of upgrade to the, you know, the base contracts, then there's like some time to react. But really, I mean, these all of these companies have this, and we use it ourselves, like at our protocol, all our contracts that you deploy mm -hmm. are by default upgradable because- And that's a, a good thing. It's a good thing because if you're still testing things out, there could be bugs and you, with an upgradable contract, you can freeze things. But this is definitely not 2018 2019 when I got started, right? Because <laughs> we always were taught that, you know, smart contracts are like immutable and think of it as like a satellite. You write the code, you launch it in space and you can't change it anymore. And that's how I try to used to explain to people about how, how it works, but not anymore, right? So it's a completely different world now. Things can be, things, you know, changed. Smart contracts especially. And yeah. it's almost like g given now. Okay. So in your time within the blockchain and crypto world, you say that it has changed a lot in the past few years. It's true. What do you think has been maybe the most radical changes, like from when you first started up until now? Uh, well, definitely see a lot more utility, right? I mean, I would say all the regulatory side. I've seen this. I kind of been through all this. So uh, I was previously the CTO at Tast and Exchange, which was a U.S. and co-founder, which we started up there in U.S. Actually, of Wyoming of all places, okay. right? Um, and because there was some regulatory precedent for starting in Wyoming. We had some access to government and maybe we can launch a new exchange there. Right. And it didn't really pan out that well. I mean, we're st they're still building. I've, I've left already. Okay. No, but, but I remember that the state government was actually very supportive. I they think, were, they companies. were, yeah. They, they, they tried, but still oh, okay. <laughs> they couldn't, right? Uh, so I've seen regulatory change a lot, right? Mm -hmm. When I first started, uh, like 20, you know, 2017, 2018, ICO days, uh, I was business development at a Chinese, well, sing Shanghai, Singapore blockchain project called Elastos. Really okay. old school. I knew like G Jihan Wu from Bitmain and uh, like the Hong Fei from Neo, and I, I knew all these people. I was really old school. Actually, I mined Bitcoin in 2009. So that's. Oh, wow. Yeah. So that's how you got started in the industry well, as a miner. I'm a software engineer by training. I, I always got, was fascinated by technology. Mm -hmm. So even like a couple years out of school, I, I found Bitcoin used to mine it, you make a Bitcoin a day, a week, sorry. Oh, wow. When we first thought it was like two or three uh, a week, and then it was like kind of got down to like one. What was the value at that time? Uh, I've seen it down, I, I remember Bitcoin being $6. And I remember uh, I sold 17 Bitcoins for a $500 gift card, I was pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> so good old days, okay. right? And I, like most people who have these stories, no, I didn't keep most of it, right? Yeah. Never really thought you would keep it, but. The way I tell myself is also I could just bought Apple stock too, right? I mean, you would, that would also have gone up like 100x, 1,000x. <laughs> um, but anyways, I've seen, yeah, the regulatory definitely has changed, right? Okay. People have clapped down, chain analysis, all these other companies. Definitely, it's pretty much assume that, you know, the government can track who you are, right? Uh, tumblers don't really work anymore because if you try to go through a tumbler or, or a mixer of some sort mm -hmm. and you try to exit, they're going to catch you. Yeah. So they, they have gotten a lot better at uh, tracing crypto 
And, for like a legal or a Yeah, and now you have the Bitcoin ETF and they're saying, well, this is actually more transparent than a lot of the other ETFs because mm. or other, other commodities because you can trace everything on Bitcoin, right? So they have, it's actually a really good argument there. I just don't think, I mean, I, I can talk all day about it. <laughs> I've actually gone through how you know, fundraising works, um, raising the 19 million that I did you know, a couple of years ago, going through like all the regulatory stuff in the US and how we had to set up the company and corporate structure to actually make this work. So that was uh, 19 million that you raised for? Uh, it's a project, Owl. yeah, not Owl, not Owl. Oh, another my, my project. previous project. Okay. Yeah. So I've been through this. I was in the US for a long time. I just moved to Dubai last year. Oh, okay. In May, yeah, okay. So. All right, Pretty so then here. what led you first to Owl Protocol and, and then to Dubai? Uh, it's a pretty interesting story, yeah. Um, so while I was co-founder CTO at, in the U.S., I did meet a very high-profile um, delegation from the UAE um, at Four Seasons, Washington, D.C. Okay, you know, at an event, a crypto event? <laughs> no, it was, it was actually an invite-only invite event. We had some other big players from crypto there. They were looking, obviously trying to court companies to come to um, the um, UAE. Um, there's a project called uh, Next Gen FDI. Okay. Um, it's just like it's a bunch of companies there actually, right? I think the recent one was Global Aviation. <laughs> anyways, um, anyways, they, uh, they, yeah, they invited us to come here. And since our protocol is also uh, another company called Vulcanlink. So we're actually a Chainlink Oracle operator. So we run Chainlink nodes and we've been doing that for a couple years now. So mm -hmm. that's cash generating and high tech and it's Web3 infrastructure. So that's okay. what they liked about us and that's what I got the invitation to come here. And at that time, I was kind of winding things down with my last company, and so it was like perfect. And <laughs> to be honest, I, I I came here in March last year with my previous company for three weeks. I loved it so much here. When I got the offer to stay, I just yeah yeah you easily jumped stay. on it. Yeah. All right, all right. So then let's get into it a little bit more. Our protocol, Vulcan Link, what your role is exactly, and what the mission and the vision behind it is. Yeah, so for our protocol, like we're really focused on like, um, adoption, like Web2 adoption. Like the biggest problem right now is there's probably 40,000, 50,000 Web3 engineers, like mm -hmm. actual developers who can actually do like blockchain. Uh, this is based on the recent report by A16Z actually, right? Um, there's two, three million good software engineers, right? And we've actually seen this demand. The reason we've focused on this is we actually talked to companies who have legacy software stack like Java or something. Okay. And they want to integrate Web3, but they can't. But the only way they can do it is they have to either start create a brand new system and migrate everything or use an API. And so what we've been building right now is like a mm. Web2 API for Web3, I would say. Right? Okay. It's kind of like uh, we take care of the private keys, but we don't uh, fire blocks or uh, DFNS or some other custodial takes, custodian takes care of the private keys. We uh, deploy the upgradable beacons and the mm -hmm. relayers to pay for gas, right? Okay. So they are upgradable contracts. They are, um, you basically don't pay for gas because we pay for the gas or, you know, we, we um, your users don't have to pay for the gas. So they can get on board really quickly. They just connect your Google account and they can just already start building or using um, Web3 or blockchain. So that's okay. kind of where we're seeing a lot of demand from. All right. So first of all, um, this is you're targeting Web3 native developers? No, or we're targeting Web2. Web2, targeting okay. Web2, Web2 developers. B2B, we're targeting Web2 companies. And who, making it easier for them to build Web2 right. applications. Right, they can, they can leverage their existing Web2 developer and their team without hiring okay. new Web3, because you just can't find them anymore, right? Mm. That's the thing. You can, Why? but they're, they're, they're such, they're so much, they're in such high demand that any Web3, any decent Web3 developer has plenty of job offers, right? We've been chasing mm. these, you know, other engineers for, you know, ages and we can't get them because, you know, anytime they, 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 they can do whatever they think is interesting, <laughs> which is, you know, we just have to give them, you know, interesting enough project, you know, but okay. there's actually way more fun stuff out there, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, as a developer, I guess, well, would you consider fun stuff? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the high tech stuff, right? We've met people who work in ZK, right? Mm -hmm. Or people who work on uh, this new project called Conduit, which one of, one of our you know, people we're trying to get went to. Conduit lets you usually launch new L2s, which even we're looking at as an interesting uh, segue. I mean, uh, maybe just, you know, we previously were talking about do we need more ch chains, right? But they help people launch L2s. Even we're considering potentially launching an L2 one oh, day, okay. right? I mean, our protocol also is kind of like the name you hear our protocol that people also assume are a blockchain. Owl? Well, our protocol, the word protocol oh, yeah. kind of conveys your okay. some sort of okay. blockchain, right? Um, so there is definitely a consideration on, on, in that route, but um, maybe down the road. But that, I would say like app chains make sense if you have a really good ecosystem already mm -hmm. working. Um, and then 
you have multi-chain figured out, which was other than, that's another thing we do also because we're chain link node operators. So because we, and I've not heard of the CCIP, the uh, chain links cross-chain interoperative protocol. Okay. So we have that kind of baked in work in the background. So like for us, for example, like if you want to create a bridge between one chain and another chain, you just have to call one API endpoint. We can do everything in the background and make it happen, mm -hmm. right? So it does help if, as long as you have like a Cosmos or Polkadot type system, it makes sense to have a separate app chain as long as that app chain isn't like in its own little world, I'd say. I hope, I hope that makes sense. So is this, you mean like interoperability that it's yeah. able to, okay, yeah. okay. So if you have that at, from the very get-go, then it makes sense because to, to developer or the user, it's kind of seamless because they could be you know transacting on Polygon or your own chain or some other chain, but as long as the, it, everything just works. Right, the user on the front end doesn't Yeah, the developer now though, can that. choose yeah. between, okay, I want a cheaper chain or I want a more secure chain. Uh, Right, or okay. on a faster chain, they can pick and choose and mix and match. Hopefully, layer zero pro projects definitely also right. That's where we're also trying to get into. Is okay, would hopefully make that all possible. All right. Yeah. And now back to something you said a little earlier. You seem to be making a case for uh, custodians. Yes. Uh, like Firebox, for example. So what what was your point there? Well, definitely, we're seeing a lot of uh, Web two companies that when they want to go into Web three. They don't have the security culture or mm -hmm. understanding of how to properly secure their private keys. Okay. Right. And if you're saying, if you're like, you know, a decentralization maxi, you want to use hardware wallets, well, giving two developers your hard your hardware keys isn't very much more secure, right, than anything else. Then give it to a like, custodial. So, so, you know, I think like decentralization and having these hardware walls and you know be, being fully decentralized makes sense if you're just storing your own funds, but it never works in an organization. Okay. When you have an organization, you like do at have the to, company yes. level, corporate level. Yeah, okay. you have servers that are signing things that are very important, right? And your, your, your how you manage those keys is super important. So actually, probably to us, it's better just to have custodian, and then down the road when you're ready, you mm -hmm. can migrate to a, like a more decentralized solution. But a lot of Web2 companies aren't ready for that. Right, right. What do you think it's going to take to get ready for that? Like, do you envision a, eventually being in a fully decentralized blockchain enabled world? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, hopefully. I think one day we have, you know, like um, instead of just private keys, like more social security, right? And Vitalik's been a big a proponent of this, right? Um, having wallets where your friends can sort of recover and get together. That's a lot harder mm, to game okay. than losing just your private keys. I think that's things will probably head in that direction, anyways. Okay. Right? So explain that a little more. You see a lot of these uh, passwordless systems, right? Where you don't really have a password anymore. It's, you have a login, and if you lose it, your friends can uh, you, you you nominate some friends that can uh, unlock your your, your mm, private keys. Okay, okay. Or you have like a cool down period where if you want to move a lot of money or over a threshold, maybe you have to ask your friends to approve it or something like that, right? Oh, so, okay. So someone you know instead of like yeah, an institution. By the way, we've already kind of uh, ascertained that the game is up for seed phrases. Nobody wants to deal with seed phrases. Nobody's gonna keep some metal cards or whatever <laughs> in, the, in their basement, um, and no one's gonna memorize private keys because people are just really bad at it yeah. in the first place. I'm definitely so not. So social always. logins, connecting your account, which is basically mm. what we do, is is a lot. It's kind of the first step, and you want to add more security on it. It has to be like granular, right? So for example, like we even in our system, we do hold uh, have some access to private keys, but we can only sign limited things. But if you're trying to play a game on Web3, you're not going to be signing something every five seconds. That's the worst UX yeah, no. app possible, right? So you got to give some, you know, permissions or you know, you know, re remove some restrictions to make the UX better for people, right? Okay. okay. If I'm moving a thousand dollars, okay, yes, prompt for me, right? Give me a prompt. But yeah, I'm but just... for gamers, no. Exactly. It so you're, you're going to see a lot more of that happening. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I would. I would like to see that. All right. And then, are there other sectors that our protocol is focusing on? Whether or if, if maybe a personally you're interested in whether it's a tokenization or NFTs. Oh, there's a lot. I mean, so I've like for three or three years I've been flying around the world, um, and one of the first things I kind of did not like was just um, again going back to like decentralized identity. Mm, now you have world coin. You didn't and like and that. I didn't like how I, I no I didn't like how things were right in in the past. Right, obviously um, I'm Canadian. I moved down to the U.S. and you couldn't bring your credit score with you. You kind of could, but you really couldn't, right? right, right. And anywhere around the world, like why, why, why is it so difficult to open a bank account somewhere else? I have a credit score, I have a house, and all these things back in my home country for like thirty years. I mean, what's the, what's the problem, right? And so um, that mm. blockchain was supposed to solve, and it still hasn't been solved. I still Good wish time. sometimes I look at it and be like, "Come on, guys, figure something." <laughs> it's like credit 
Credit scores are really important and we've tried to move it on chain, but back to human element again, right? When you still need like the off chain side of things and banks don't want to play nice anyways. Right, right. So they're yeah, scared. The, they're scared of the new revolution for sure. Absolutely. The revolution, the crypto revolution. <laughs> yeah, because it kind of does remove a lot of the, yeah, we've seen so many things too, like banks, I don't know, why, why are banks open nine to five or something like that, right? This oh my God, right? <laughs> well, why can't I send a wire out, you know, on the weekend? <laughs> I know, I know. Right? I want my money immediately when I need it. And it's totally possible. I just, uh, you know, they're just kind of ingrained in the past, right? So. Yeah. Okay. So then um, let's delve into that a little more. That's one of the issues I think that you want blockchain to solve. What other sectors or maybe are, are you looking at that you think might um, have the most adoption right now in the next bull run? Like, are there any factors that might lead to an uptick in the market? Well, yeah, we've seen this a lot too, right? So uh, a lot of companies now have basically removed the language like NFTs mm -hmm. out, of, out of their any of their materials. And uh, the next wave of adoption really should be Web3 without knowing your own Web3, right? It should function right. and work exactly the same as it, it works now. And even our protocol, we're doing that right now. So the idea is that, yeah, so right now you can we can create a wallet for you, a safe wallet. Um, without, with just your Google login or something like mm -hmm. that, right? And then we also pay for the gas fees and we also make everything state of the art so it's upgradable and you can get new features and updates on the fly. You don't even know it, just updates automatically, right? And so you're going to see a lot more of that. And then we slowly ease people into the fact that they have a wallet, right? So, okay. Okay. you know, you have these, I mean, we're, we're calling them um, unique digital items now, right? Collectibles. Collectibles yes. even is kind of, iffy of a, of a word. Yeah, but I think people are more into that than NFTs. That worked for Reddit, calling them digital collectibles. Yeah, or digital digital memberships, right? And right now, when you say digital memberships, it's very much centralized digital membership. But um, right. we can use the same word and just say it's Web3, but it's a lot more interoperable, right? Yeah. Because when you have an on-chain digital membership, the whole thing about, I'd say, uh, blockchain that makes import, makes you know Web3 exciting is this whole thing, I, I call it, like, you can permissionless, right? If you mm -hmm. say either permissionless or unilateral um, effects where you can have, if you have a membership and I wanted to create a promotion or something, right? I don't need your permission to create that promotion for you. Right, right. right? You can just, I can say, you know, if someone has your uh, NFT or your, your membership card and they come into my coffee shop or something, they get a free coffee. Right. Like that's, well, that's like um, Starbucks did that with their loyalty program. Yeah, I mean, and any, anyone can tie into that and yeah. build on top of that and build, build multiple, you know, layers of like benefits and rewards for mm -hmm. that, right? So I like to see that hopefully happening more. Yeah, I think that's definitely a really good use case for, for NFTs that people already know and are yeah. familiar with and understand, but kind of upgrade the, the rewards. Yeah, system. yeah, and we're, going, we're hopefully going beyond just like a token gating. So right now, usually it's a yes or no question, mm -hmm. right? So do you have NFT or not? There's already token proof and all these things that do that. But you now have probably heard of like dynamic NFTs, right? Or yeah, NFTs yeah. with data. So that you can change, actually yeah. have additional data on top, not just like do you have the NFT, but is it like silver or gold or platinum status? And then based on your status or your points, you can get different rewards, right? So we want to build a much more dynamic future into these collectibles. So you just actually, you collect them, but you also upgrade them, their tier and things like that. Um, and they're like badges or something as, as you collect, as you go through life. And hopefully the next generation of kids will grow up with this, these things and it'll be so easy to use, intuitive, um, that they just collect them throughout their whole lives. Right, right. Um, privacy concerns for different discussion <laughs> next Put time. Aside, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, it is much more open now. I think people don't really they look at social media, right? People are definitely, privacy is, I don't know. I mixed topic. But. I know. I think I've accepted that like all my information, private information, is out there. It is what it is. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Unfortunately. Um, but going back to NFTs, do you own any NFTs, or are there any collections that you like? Uh, I own a few, but no, I don't really. I've kind of stopped okay. looking at that, or even a lot of the markets these days. Uh, okay. You know, stop while trading. it's in a bear market. Yeah, yeah. When you focus on tech, you just sort of have projects you believe in, you hold them, and then just same thing. You just sort of focus on that. Like I advise a few projects. So obviously I have their tokens, but I don't trade. Okay. Yeah. All right. And then what else can we expect from Owl Protocol and Vulcan Link? What's next? Yeah. So we uh, have our API uh, right now and we are beta testing with a few clients, but in the future, we definitely want to showcase the ability right now. Um, you can already say a, a game can integrate our API and create wallets for all their users in the background. User doesn't 
see anything different to them, and they mm -hmm. all they all get their own wallet. They actually have full control of their assets. So mm -hmm. obviously, you can mint things to their wallet. They don't know that they're wallet, but they can't transfer them out. And okay. one day, you can come along and say, "Well, I have all these assets. In my game, believe it or not, they're actually digital items that you can NFTs, really, right? That you yeah. can take uh, and bring them to another." game or something like that and okay. hopefully one day that gets unlocked so we're, which assets exactly is it just in-game assets or what other types of assets so we're looking at like loyalty programs right or point systems real world assets as well you can okay. have some real world assets that are tied to like you know, i don't know real shoes. estate for example no oh, just physical objects yeah i don't think you're going to see real estate for a long time i've seen mm. hundreds of companies try to do that but governments like to play along as well <laughs> right um so but hopefully the idea is like, right now we're not seeing any intersection right now too. It's interesting because we developed this API, we figured out, we want to have a wallet per application, right? That's okay. a, that was a big question we had. And one thing we saw was that even if we had one wallet per application, I mean, even if we wanted a universal wallet that was one wallet for all your apps, right. there's a very low chance that a person who went to one app and then to another app, they might see their other assets there's, no, there's very little overlap right now. The interoperability doesn't really even matter right now. So I know, I know. We'll we have see. a lot to get there. All right. Well, yeah. any last words, any advice or final thoughts um, for those out there that want to uh, learn more about uh, Owl Protocol? Yeah, I mean, our, our website is owlprotocol.xyz. Um, you can obviously contact us there. And we'd love to see if anyone wants to actually use our API um, and integrate with their existing platform. Um, it's really easy to use, just like if you want to use this. If, you, if your developers know how to use a Stripe API, they can use our API. That's what I oh, try okay. to aim for. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for oh, your for time, sure. Clarence. Thanks. And everyone, please stay tuned for the rest of Crypto TV. In the crypto market, Bitcoin price is at $37,824, Ethereum is trading green at $2,041 today, BNB Smart Chain is up and trading currently at $228.4, and Lido DAO is up nearly 3.54% today with a price of $2.33. And that is all the time that we have for today. So I want to thank you for tuning in to this episode of Crypto TV. Make sure to give this video a like and check out other Web3 TV coverage on our page. See you guys later.